Welcome to Meet the Candidates. The Frankfurt Plant Board has let us come in here to their studios and invite the candidates in to sit down with us, talk for a little while, so we have an opportunity to get to know them as a person, as a candidate, find out what their thoughts are on the issues facing this campaign. Uh, it, it's changing from one area to the next on which offices we're dealing with, but in this one, it's sort of specific. We, uh, we have Rick Rogers in here to talk to us about re-election as jailer. Yes, and we know that there are some problems there. We want to look at those problems and see what might be happening with there, but we also know there could very well be some problems and issues that we don't know anything about. If you'd like to bring them to our attention, now is when we'd like to hear about it. But number one, unfortunately, there's always an, an issue with drugs in the community as Absolutely. a whole and at the jail. Yes, ma'am. Now, do you have any plans for changing any of your protocol, any new regs, any way of dealing with it? Absolutely, I'm so glad you asked that question. Because oftentimes people think that once somebody comes in the jail, the criminal activity stops, and it does not. Um, I worked as a deputy sheriff and, I, and a detective, and I worked in narcotics investigations. So I have a, a kind of a, a good knowledge of how that stuff works. And since I've been a jailer, uh, I've noticed that you know our community is under attack. Uh, the heroin and meth epidemic has taken us by storm, and it's in our jail. We've done a heroin buy in our jail early in my term to get it out with the experience that I've had. But since I've been in office, I'll tell you just a few of the things we've done to, to kind of thwart the jail, uh, the, the drugs coming in our jail. The first thing we did is change some of our intake procedures. Uh, we have people that come in our jail, and the, jail, the judges sentence them and tell them to maybe report on a certain date and time. And those people sometimes take, it, take that to their advantage and they will ingest or insert things into their, into their body to try to smuggle those into the jail. So when they come into our jail now, we have them, we put them in a dry cell for, a sm for an amount of time that they're not sure of when they're getting out to try to get those drugs out of their system and maybe, uh, maybe catch them before they can get. Okay define dry cell. A dry cell, cell. yes, yes. ma'am. A dry cell is where we shut the water off and we give them water and food uh, on a documented basis so that we can control if they flush anything or if they have any, any ingestion of, of water or anything like that. We know exactly uh, what their consumption is and if they, if they have an opportunity to get rid of the drugs through our uh, toilets. So that's one thing we've done. We've also inside the jail the inmates um, they pass things through the tray service and sort of our basic daily routine they get very familiar with our daily routine so they take advantage of the things that we do on a daily basis to try to smuggle the drugs throughout the jail so those people that are in that dry cell we serve them on a uh, on a different uh, type of tray that's disposable so they don't have the opportunity to get that stuff out of that dry cell and into another inmate's hands for passage on down or on down through the through the jail. I am totally ignorant unfortunately about a lot of the things that happen at, at the jail and I am a little perplexed as to what would be their point. Why why are they doing something that they know is going to create a problem for them? Well you have to think, you know, when the police officers and deputy sheriffs, when they lock up drug users and bring them to our jail, the drugs come with them. They just don't, they don't stop using drugs just because they've come to jail. And in jail, drugs are money. That's how they get what they want in jail, and they can barter. They have their own barter system in the jail, and, and that's a huge way for them to get things they want, commissary items or, or visitation or, or that sort of thing. They, they use that to their advantage. Uh, they can use it to trade for phone time, to use the phones. It, it's, it's, um, it's unbelievable the things that they come up with. I'll tell you one of the best things that I've done since, since taking office. I worked with the fiscal court and they allowed us to buy a body scanner. And this body scanner, uh, we employ that at the booking process. When somebody comes in, uh, we, they have to meet a certain criteria to, for an unclosed search. They have to have a, a 
past history of drug use or current drug or, or uh, assault charges, something like that, to meet the criteria for us to conduct an unclosed search. And that is an unpleasant experience, not only for the, the inmate, but also for my staff. So we, have, we, we got the uh, body scanner. It's in our booking area, and it's the same same type of body scanner that you would go through at an airport, but it allows us to see through that person to see if they've ingested or inserted anything into their into their body to try to smuggle past us. And I'll tell you, as of January 1st, we've had 10 indictments that we've used that body scanner and caught people smuggling stuff into our jail that would have normally got past us. Uh, we've caught heroin, meth, uh, marijuana, and I think a little bit of cocaine so far this year. Uh, last year, I think we were around 20 indictments off of that machine. So it's not perfect. We don't catch everything, but it's a whole lot better than when, what we've had in the past. What new protocols do you have in mind uh, for realigning all of all of your services? Uh, do you, for example, have a chief deputy where you're going to assign certain responsibilities to that would relieve some other areas? I, I'm, as I said, I'm functioning from near that's total great. ignorance. No, that's a great question. Uh, I do have a chief deputy. Um, he serves as the assistant jailer. If I'm not able to be reached or not able to respond to the jail, uh, he fulfills my capacity. He is a great guy. He has uh, also about 20 years of law enforcement and military experience. He was a paramedic. Uh, he was my platoon commander in the Marine Corps. And he, he was a Richmond police officer. He was the National Police Officer of the Year in 2011. Um, I asked him to come down here and help me get our jail back up and running and he has just been a tremendous asset. One of the other things I've done is, uh, you know, in my past, I served as the chief deputy at the jail under jailer Ted Hammermeister during his administration. I had a lot on my plate. <laughs> so uh, I took a little bit of the, the duties that I had as a chief deputy and I distributed them out and I created two captain's positions. I have four shifts that work, they each work 12 hours. Uh, when two shifts are working, two shifts are off. And I have the captains that are over both those shifts, the two day shifts and the two night shifts. So they alleviate a little of the pressure off the chief deputy trying to keep track of all of the employees and deal with all the issues that we have. But we're, ver we're very lucky to have the chief deputy that we have. That has an impact on your budget. What kind of budget problems are you facing right now? And, and do you have any plans for changing those budget priorities? I mean, everybody talks about budget. Yes, ma'am. So give us a kind of an overview of what you're doing with your budget. Okay. Um, budget is a huge thing for you, the taxpayer. For me, as an elected official, I have to be fiscally responsible. And our budget is about $4.2 million. The jail creates the majority of that money. Now, under my first under my first year as Franklin County Jailer, I was under the old jailer's budget. I had no input mm -hmm. on that budget. And through my game plan, uh, we were still able to save the taxpayers $83,000 off, off that first budget. They typically supplement the jail about $1.8 million a year. So out of that $1.8 million, I saved them $83,000 that first year. Second year, when we were on my game plan, we're approximately about $350,000 that we saved our taxpayers. So we, they didn't have to pay the whole $1.8 million. And last year, we saved them a little over $630,000. So my game plan's working. We've done that through several different different areas. We've renegotiated the contracts from the price of Lysol all the way up to the price the inmates have to pay to use the phones, uh, which we lowered that, as a matter of fact, so that they could use the phones more, but it also generated more revenue. Um, so we're very proud of what we've done with our budget. Uh, we've done that. Uh, we've also... Uh, contracted with the Federal Mar Federal Marshal Service. We hold some of their prisoners and we have a contract with Owen County to hold some of their inmates. And when you hear me say that, they pay us to hold their inmates. And anybody that comes in our jail that's a Franklin County inmate that was arrested here in Franklin County, we the taxpayers pay for. So it's very important for us to try to offset that cost for our taxpayers. So when we hold other entities inmates, that kind of uh, offsets what the Franklin County taxpayer has to pay for us to house our, uh, uh, hold the inmates. So uh, we're, we're saving money and we're looking forward to continuing to save money. Now reading newspaper articles, we would assume that you're having an increasing number of uh, inmates from this area. Uh, give us kind of a picture of, of what 
it has been what it is and what you think it might that is, be. That is a great soon. question too. There's a lot of things in flux right now, corrections, and we try to stay on top mm -hmm. of that. And luckily being in Frankfurt, we get to keep our ear to the ground for the what the legislature pretty close. Um, we hold, every jail in the state, every prison in the state is full, every one. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the inmates outnumber where they can go. Um, we hold about 306 inmates, that's our capacity. I think today when I left the jail, we were about 340. Um, and that comes, a lot of that's coming from the opioid, the drug crisis that we're seeing. And so we deal with those problems when those people come in. They're not in good shape. Um, and what I see going forward, there's a lot of legislation out there right now. I haven't, haven't seen any of it passed yet that's going to work to uh, try to reduce some of the population for what we call a state inmate, somebody that's committed a felony, um, changing some arrest procedures for our law enforcement so that they can cite and release on some different things that they're not doing now mm -hmm. or not able to do. So it'll lower not only our county inmate population but our state inmate population. And as trends go, normally that you'll see the population dip for a little while and then those people unfortunately get out and reoffend, and they come back and what I'm scared of is when they come back they come back on the county's dime which you the taxpayers uh, have to pay for them until uh, certain certain processes in court are followed so um, I see it dipping in the future and then I see it going back up uh, the state is elected to open three private prisons um, that's not going to touch our population uh, it will barely uh, alleviate any overcrowding at a huge cost to the taxpayers. What do you see as a trend of what type of inmate returns to you? Um, are, are they committing the same crimes over and over or are they expanding into new areas? Well, unfortunately, um, I can remember an inmate the day that I started working in the jail in 1999 I remember walking in the kitchen, and I remember the inmate, I remember his name, and when I walked in my first day as Franklin County Jailer, that inmate was working in the kitchen. And he's kind of the typical misdemeanor, uh, misdemeanor inmate. He gets out for six months, he comes back for 30 days, he gets out for a year, he comes back, kind of updates his information for us. Um, and it's unfortunate that we have that type of, of, of problem in our community, but um, it, it does happen. now. What we're seeing as far as more serious charges is the drug offenses and property offenses are going through the roof. So uh, to buy heroin, uh, it's a very expensive habit. Heroin's sold in a tenth of a gram. When I quit buying heroin through the narcotics uh, investigations at the sheriff's office, it was about $80 for a tenth of a gram, a little less than what you'd salt your mashed, mashed potatoes with. And to fund that habit, they have to steal. So you see the property crimes going up. So we're seeing a big conjunction of, of property crimes and, and drug-related offenses in our community. I, do, I will say our law enforcement guys out there on the street are, are doing a great job. Uh, they need more manpower, as we all do. What's happening there at the jail? What Are there services that are offered? Are there certain medical things that happen? What precisely is the jail doing other than just sitting them in a chair and you watching them? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. That's kind of a complex question. It you asked is. about 10 questions at uh -huh. one time there. I'll try to get all of them. Um, so we have a lot of programs at our jail. Um, every jailer that's been there uh, that I know of has always had AA, NA, Bible study, parenting classes, that sort of thing. Well, my administration, we've taken a little different look at things and we've looked at some different programs and one of the uh, one of the programs that we've started is what's called the Jailer's Good Time Program. That's throughout the state uh, but we were one of the first to start it and what that does is allows our misdemeanor inmates, the county inmates that I just talked about, when they get sentenced they can come to work in the jail. They can work in our kitchen, they can work in our laundry, they can work in our custodial services and for every 40 hours that they work I can take a day off of their sentence. For every 30 days that they have good behavior in our jail, which we really appreciate, they get five days off, off their sentence. 
And if they work to obtain their GED while they're in, in, incarcerated, mm -hmm. they get 30 days off their sentence. And we keep the judges apprised of, of who's where in that program. It's worked well for us. We've also introduced what we call MRT program. It's moral recognition training. We just started this, and that's for our state inmates. And our state inmates, that, that program is designed to help hold them, account, hold them accountable for their decisions and actions that help get them to where they're at in their current state. I have a deputy who found this course. She researched it. She went to the training. She wrote the policy and procedure, and she brought it to me. And we've got several inmates enrolled in it right now. And when those state inmates complete those courses, uh, the Department of Corrections takes 90 days off their sentence. Now, I'll tell you one of the best things we've done um, is we've always had a partnership with the Thornhill Learning Center, our education center. Mm -hmm. um, Rita Rector and her staff have worked with us to put our foot on the gas for the GD program. Um, they also, they've always offered a GD program and now we've helped them integrate computers into the classroom there at the jail. So it makes their job and the inmates job to learn the, the materials a lot easier. And they've also started offering what's called a NCRC, a National Career Readiness Certification. That program's about eight weeks and that program helps inmates with reading and math and things to get them ready to go out into the job force. And when, that, when they hit that mark, there's three different levels of that NCRC certificate. Mm -hmm. There's gold, platinum, and silver, and there's a monetary incentive to each one of those. So the inmate gets a little, a little something for completing that. And we really encourage them to do that while they're taking their GED. And since I've been the jailer uh, since 2015, uh, we've put our foot on the gas and we've had 237 inmates graduate with their GD and their NCRC certificate. So that really says a lot to Rita Rector and her staff and my staff for trying to push that program for the inmates. And statistics show that education is the number one key to stopping the recidivism, which is the rate that inmates come back through the door. Right, and you have seen a decrease in those people uh, coming back? You we don't really track that. Uh, I, I could probably look and see that there would be a decrease in those certain in individuals, I would say the Thornhill uh, uh, staff probably tracks that pretty close. I think it, as a citizen of the community, I would be interesting, interested in, in knowing that. What about going beyond that? Are there skill sets that are taught? Of, and I guess more importantly, even than skill sets there of, of actual jobs that they could perform when they get out. Are, are there any steps taken uh, to decrease the likelihood that they're going back into the heavy drug usage, which would bring them right back? Well, all those classes are kind of designed to help do that. Um, now, we also have state inmates that go work at various job sites throughout our community at all of our nonprofit location, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, and a lot of state and county government work sites, and they learn good skills there. We recently uh, partnered with uh, Frankfurt Parks and Rec and had some inmates certified um, and going after the invasive species plants that we've had problems with throughout our community. Mm -hmm. And those inmates can take those certifications when they get out and do more things uh, with those and kind of start their own business if they want to. Um, and we're looking forward to this spring so we can get that program up and running again. We have a great community services director. His name's Andrew Moore. And if a nonprofit agency calls us and needs help, we're, he's on the ball with the inmates to go help them. Which brings us back as a citizen of this community, I would want to know about the safety level of this. What steps do you take to ensure that the ones that are out into the community doing some of these uh, assigned duties are really not going to create a problem for the people around them? Well, that's a very good question. The inmates that, that are out in our community go through a classification process through the Department of Corrections. The Department of Corrections has uh, classification officers that take each individual inmate, go through their history, go through their family, go through that specific individual's background, and they classify them at different levels. Um, there are certain inmates that can go work out in the community. There are certain inmates that can only work at the jail. There are certain inmates that can only work inside the jail, not outside of the jail. Kind of a very complex classification process, but you can't guarantee that these guys are always going to make the right decision. Um, 
We, we do have issues now and then of people, you know, they have a lot of freedom. They know where they're going most days when they're going to work. So we've had issues, and that's why I've hired an investigator to come in and investigate criminal activity inside and outside our jail that has to do with our inmate population. He's a retired police officer. Um, he's worked narcotics just like I have. So he knows the game and he's done an outstanding job. So if we hear of an, uh, a situation outside of one of these work sites, he investigates it and he will prosecute it if he finds criminal activity. Now, unfortunately, and I regret having to do this, but it did come to our attention that there was a problem with a safety issue of the wrong inmate yes, getting released. Tell us a little bit about that and what steps, if any, you have taken to ensure that that doesn't happen absolutely, again. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we did have an unfortunate incident where an inmate posed as another inmate uh, and our staff did, did not do the correct uh, checks and balances system to uh, make sure that we're releasing the proper inmate. Um, since that incident, I have met with all of my command staff that have the authority to release inmates out of our system. I've gone over the process and training. Um, I also have my captains uh, now review the releases for those upcoming days. And uh, it, had they followed the process, it wouldn't have been an issue, but ultimately I'm the jailer. That's my responsibility uh, for any mishaps that we take, and I take mm -hmm. full responsibility for that. Uh, the best thing you can do is learn from your mistakes, and we've learned from our mistakes, and not to say we won't ever have an inadvertent release again, but we'll try our best to make sure we don't, we don't go down that path again. We've gone through so many different things very quickly. You, you, you approach <laughs> this very, very quickly and knowledgeably. Uh, what areas would you like to see accomplished during a new term as jailer? What would you be focusing on? What would you be working toward? And how would you go about doing it? Well, one of the biggest issues that we face is the physical plan of our jail. Our jail was built in 1986. It's over 30 years old. Uh, the inmates don't necessarily treat it in the best manner. So we have a lot of issues there. Um, when I came on board, I walked in the jail after being gone since 2007, and I could not believe the, the shape that it was in. It was not the jail that Jailer Hammermeister and I left in 2007. Everything was working great then. Uh, we had doors that were in disrepair. We had uh, plumbing issues. Our air conditioning system was at 40%. The boilers weren't working properly. Uh, the smoke evacuation system wasn't working. Uh, we had a leaky roof all over the place. So we took those problems to the fiscal court and, and showed them what we were dealing with. And our fiscal court and Judge Wells has just been tremendous in helping me to, to get the jail back where it needs to be as far as our physical plant. Now that being said, life expectancy of a jail is about 30 years in the in corrections industry. So we're, we're beyond that. Uh, we're taking a lot of a, a lot of steps to try to extend that, but I would say in the next probably in the next 10 years or so, we're going to have to have to look at maybe uh, building a jail or partnering partnering with surrounding counties to build a, a regional jail. It's very expensive, but I see that as probably our main um, problem going forward. And of course, always budget issues, but like I said, we're working very hard to keep the budget under control. And one of the things I'm most proud of that we've done with our budget is we were able to raise the starting pay uh, working with fiscal court and the compensation committee. They raised our pay from 12 to $14 an hour for my, my new deputies. And that's really helping to slow the turnover rate of staff. So uh, we've just had a great partnership with fiscal court. They're open to anything I have to tell them. And they don't, they're not an expert on the jail. Uh, but luckily, I've, I've kind of spent my life around that jail, so I know a lot about it. Do you have an idea of how you would best approach maintaining as opposed to replacing the jail physical facility? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's a great question. There's two options you got there. You can build a new facility, and there's also some energy saving groups out there that will come in and kind of retrofit your whole jail. Uh, they go through the lights, the electric, the plumbing, the water, and the plumbing is one of the things that's really going to get us if we don't keep our thumb on it at the jail. So um, we've got two options, and, and uh, we'll present those to the fiscal court at the proper time. 
So are, are you actively investigating those at, at the I'll, moment, or do you have that on a future list? I'm looking into it right now. I'm always looking down the road. Are there other changes in protocol that you anticipate implementing during a new term, or do you think you have things under control at the moment and have a main Maintaining situation as far as the way you operate. The, the way we operate is, is very, very efficient. Uh, jails run on a basic daily routine, much mm -hmm. like the military, which which I, I come from. Um, to say we have a handle on it, you learn very quick as a jailer that there's things you control and there's things that you do not control. Um, the things that we can tr control are are taken care of and the things that we cannot control we try to an anticipate and try to make sure that we have the right plan in place for if and when that situation occurs. I know there are lots more things you would like to talk about That's but okay. we're kind of running out of time at the moment so would you look into this yes, camera and tell our viewers why you are the better candidate and they should vote for you on May 22nd as jailer of Franklin County? Absolutely thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Rick Rogers. I am your current Franklin County Jailer. I have over 20 years of law enforcement and corrections experience, which I think make me uniquely qualified to be your Franklin County Jailer. I encourage you to compare my training and experience with that of my opponents, and I think you'll find that I'm the only qualified candidate to be your Franklin County Jailer. I have the full support and endorsement of former jailers James Kemper and Ted Hammermeister. I've worked hard in my first term as jailer to save your taxpayer dollars, We've saved you about a million dollars to date and we'll continue to make your jail something you can be proud of and try to save you money going forward. I ask for your vote and support on Tuesday, May 22nd in re-electing Rick Rogers as Franklin County Jailer. Thank you and God bless. We want to thank Rick for taking time out of his very busy schedule to come in here and talk with us. It's been a chance for us to get to know him as a person as well as a candidate. Don't forget the candidate forum, April 26th. Come back for our live coverage of the election results and be sure you come back here for more Meet the Candidates.